Of all of the stereotypes of people in the art world, I think my favorite has to be that of gallerists and artists. They're always either dressed head to toe in black and moody and brooding, or dressed like clowns and wildly eccentric. But those couldn't be further from the truth. Don't believe me? Let's find out. I'm Julian Baumgartner. As a fine art conservator over the past two decades working to preserve artworks, I've been fortunate enough to meet and work with some of the most talented, driven, and interesting people in the arts. And now I want to take you into their worlds, to meet them, hear their stories, and share their passions. So join me as we go Behind the Canvas. As the long winter descends upon the city of Chicago, there really couldn't be a better time to head indoors. And today I'll do so at the Thomas McCormick Gallery. Nestled in the once industrial and now hip and thriving West Loop neighborhood of Chicago, this location was opened in 2000 by collector, dealer, gallerist, lover of art, and longtime friend, Tom McCormick. And today he's going to let me peek into his space to learn what it takes to run a successful art gallery. Too bad I don't know a good conservator. <laughs> hey, Tom. Hey, man. Well, I recognize the painting. What it do looks you think? fantastic here, Tom. Well, you you did the work on it, so. Yeah, but there's a difference between the way I see them in my studio, and then when you get them, you put the frame on them, you put them here in your gallery, you light them well. The whole gallery looks great. Honestly, Thanks. Tom, it's probably been a decade or so since I've been here. So I figured I needed a break from my studio. Yeah. I'm gonna go bug Tom and see what uh, he's doing at the gallery. And actually, I think I have a good idea of what you do, but I actually don't really know the nitty gritty of what you actually do during the day. Mm -hmm. So I thought maybe I'd come by and, and bother you and find out. Okay, good. Well, let's look around some more and we'll talk. Please. Is this a, like, is this a show that you're doing right now, putting on? No, it, this is just uh, material that normally lives in storage in the back room, in the racks, and in the winter in Chicago, not a lot of people are out, so I enjoy looking at them, and when people come in, they go, oh, well, this is kind of nice to see the variety of can different we, stuff we do. Can we see the racks? Sure. I, that's yeah. where I'm most comfortable, oh. digging through stacks of yeah. paintings. I like your racks, too, at, the, at, <laughs> at, your, at, my studio? at your studio, yeah. Well, these are, these are really beautiful. So this is for the oversized paintings. These are all actually estate paintings. These are all dead artists. Tom, this is so well organized and so clean. I covet storage like this. I, my compliments, my God. Yeah, I loved it when we designed these. The, this room used to be a second exhibition gallery. I needed more room for people to come in and- Storage. People feel the same way. They want, oh, what's that? Oh, what's that? Show us that. So you do a mix of living and dead artists, I, I presume. Is, I do. Was, is that by choice? Yeah, it is. I mean, I started out uh, in the antiques world, and, and then one day I bought a, a painting by a, a dead artist, and the antique dealers didn't know what they had, and I didn't know either, but I went and found out, and I made a whole lot of money on it, and I thought a big light went, <laughs> and I go, oh, I should start looking for old paintings. Sure. We live in the Midwest you know, which a lot of the world would see as a, as a bad thing. We determined it was a really, really good thing because flyover country was filled with overlooked artists who'd had their careers in Des Moines or Kansas City and they died and their relatives had these, these, this fabulous trove of paintings. And this was all before the internet. You could go and meet somebody and at the end of the day, you, you had found a, a whole trove of beautiful, beautiful art that has sat you know, overlooked, ignored for decades. You know, this looks familiar. Oh, I don't ever want to see that one again, You just Tom. worked on this one for me. That was... And it looks fantastic. Now, this is a Pearl Fine painting from 1964, I think, and I believe this painting was rolled up for about 50 years. Yeah, I think he brought it to me straight out of a barn or something, yeah. um, and it needed a, a lot of conservation work. Is When you find estates, is that usually where they are, like kind of just uh, in a storage yeah, facility? Yeah, it and depends. I mean, you, you hope they're not in a barn, you know, you hope they've been taken care of. And, but sometimes it's grandpa's paintings that are out in the shed. And, you know, as you've seen over the many years we've worked together and before that with your dad, you know, things come, they're damaged or dirty or rolled up or, you know, they need, they need some attention. So part of what the gallery really does when it deals with the states is take something that's like you said, lost or forgotten to history and 
revisit it, breathe some new light into it, and kind of give it a second chance, a, a new lease on life. Right. That's kind of essential to what you're doing here. Right. Throughout his career, Tom has salvaged hundreds of paintings and countless estates of artists that have been overlooked, undervalued, and hidden away in dusty attics, barns, or forgotten storerooms. This work is demanding, intense, and not without risk, but Tom knows that these works of art have an important story to tell, and by collecting, restoring, documenting, and placing them into collections, that story can be preserved for future generations and expand the larger narrative of art history. For many artists, especially those who were not well known during their lifetimes, there may be very little information available about their work. And that's why Tom and his team take great care in creating catalogs and essays that record the history of these paintings and their artists. By doing so, they're helping to ensure that the artists' contributions to the art world are recognized and appreciated. Remember when you used to do posters? Galleries made posters for a show. I'm never sure where you were I don't supposed to put that. them up, but you know. Maybe that predates is, me. Uh, you know, I don't even know that we, catalogs, are, catalogs may not even be appropriate anymore, you know. I almost could just do a catalog and just send it out virtually. I don't know, I like, I like the, just the physicality of it. Well, you know? the paintings are physical, they're tangible objects. It makes sense to have something to go along with them, but so, People get these catalogs in the mail, they open them up, and they call you up and they say, Tom, I love this painting, I want to buy it. Great. <laughs> That's right, great. I'll send that out. How do you find people? And Well, okay, so I've been doing this 51 years. Okay. So you start to build up a client list. All right. You go so to meet people. You go to New York, we go to Miami, you go to LA, go to I used to go to San Francisco every year. So it's really kind of like the, the boots on the ground, scrappy hustle of grinding it out, which yeah. is how you find the yeah. estates. I had a guy call me yesterday who I met in about 1995 in Boston looking for a Roger Brown painting. Oh, well, that's cool. Uh, it, was way, it was way cool. I actually had one to offer to him also. Has the clientele changed as um, they've aged or as culture has changed? Are you seeing different types of people come in and finding interest in this work? Some of my older clients are still buying. A lot of older clients, though, are also starting to sell their work. They're downsizing. They've sold the big house. The kids are gone. And actually, this has been a, a big boon for me because I'm now buying you things buy it back. back I sold 20 years ago. Oh, that's interesting. Which is such an easy way to go shopping. <laughs> you know, it's like I can shop at Tom's. And so you already I, have the catalog, yeah, right? Uh, I can buy a painting that I sold 15 years ago for fifteen thousand dollars that might be worth one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars now if I could find it. Well, one place to find it is the people I sold it to back then. But finding paintings and selling paintings, you've got to find the right painting for the right client. You got to make that match, right? I know if I can sell a painting, I can look at a painting and I can be across a football field and I can say to you. I can sell that painting. How, how do you know that? I just, I don't know. I just know it. I can also say I couldn't sell that painting in a million years. So you kind of rely on your own internal kind of compass about what's, what's good. I think if you're going to survive and prosper in this business, you've got to have, you got to have something going for yourself. I'm sure that you've missed, right? You've looked at a painting and said, I can sell it. And you just oh, yeah. like oh, totally. Oh, no, no, no. no. Yeah, I, I have. I've had some real groaners. You know? <laughs> I have one I think you'll recognize. Oh. It's in the back room. Uh oh, you'll remember this. I like this painting, Tom. It's a fabulous painting. So it's why is this a miss? It's not what I hoped it was when I bought it. And now, obviously, this is a real outlier because this this is like a 16th or 17th century painting, not a 1950s or a 2022 painting. This showed up at a local auction. I bid $1,000, I got it for $1,000. Long story short, I got a friend of mine who did the research. He found the actual painting in a museum in Europe that this is a copy. Oh, of. I see. So it's a copy, it's probably an 18th century copy of a 17th century painting. I mean, you, you know this, look, yeah. at, look at this thing. It's, this is a mahogany panel yep. from one tree. It wasn't made to deceive. I mean, it's really an old and painting. And it bears a label of ex oh, and there's exceptional a label. Yes, conservation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just not worth what I, what I had hoped it was. In fact, I didn't clean it at first because if it was really a 17th century painting by the guy, 
probably the ultimate buyer would want to buy it as is. Yeah, I remember you hemmed and hawed about yeah, it. Yeah, because a lot of collectors, they want to know what's been done to it. Right. But once I determined it wasn't that, I had you go ahead and clean it up and you know. So, the, so only when it was a dud did I get to work right. on it. Uh, that's, thanks. That's the way the world works. Thanks, Tom. So contemporary wise, this is Ben Tinsley who we represent, Bill Barrett, sculptor from Santa Fe, John Santoro, um, there's a Vidvid Zvidras, you know Vidvids well. I do, yeah. A couple of Vidvidses. Um, here's a beautiful Mike Hedges, a Janice Posey Johnson, Another Ben Tinsley. So you deal with a lot of living artists. Oh yeah. Well, I think we have uh, ten or eleven that we, which is pretty much all I can handle. I mean, well, for one, they all want to have a show, you know, every couple of years, and we can only do so much. And I want to represent the ones we have. I want to do a good job. It sounds like sometimes contemporary artists may be more difficult than the dead ones. It's a whole different um, series of um, joys, pleasures, and challenges. <laughs> Actually, one of the challenges I have is that Anna Kuntz, who I've known longer than any of the others, I met Anna when I first moved here almost 30 years ago. I don't have any of her paintings right now. And we need one for the Chicago Art Fair, which is coming up in April. Yeah. So we actually have an appointment to go to her studio and pick out a painting or two. Oh, that's so cool. do you want to go along? I'd, I'd love to, that'd yeah. Be fun? Yeah, I mean, is it okay? Yeah, we'll call her up and tell her we're coming. Okay. <laughs> All right, All right. Let's, let's go. Let's do it. My time in the Thomas McCormick Gallery made clear how centered around the art everything is. The lighting, the placement of the pieces, and the overall narrative story of the space and how the works relate to one another are carefully considered to create an immersive and engaging experience for visitors. It's a stark contrast to the artist's studio, which is often reclusive, idiosyncratic, and sometimes a bit chaotic. But there's something viscerally exciting about seeing an artist at work in their studio. It's a glimpse into their creative mind and the genesis of the transformation from raw, unrefined idea to carefully crafted and highly focused piece of art. And if I know Tom, I think I'm in for something truly special. Julia, Hi, Anna, it's a thanks pleasure. for coming. Thank you for having me. I understand so this is uh, precious space and we're crashing it, this but is, I really appreciate it. The sensation of walking from the blank hallway into here, it's kind of like the, the scene from um, Wizard of Oz when Dorothy it is. lands. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's really intense. Yes. For the past two decades, Anna Kunz has been creating work that uses and misuses the fundamental elements of color, form, and surface to collapse the distance between viewer and artwork suggesting a way of seeing and being in the world that privileges sensation over interpretation. Anna's resume is dauntingly impressive with exhibits and pieces in collections and museums all over the world. Thanks to Tom and some good timing, I'm lucky to be given a first-hand tour of the studio and Anna's working process. Love, love, love this one. You can't have it. That's... I want this one. You yeah, know, I, I really like this one too. It's cool. why, why this one, Tom? You remember when we were over at my gallery and I made this kind of ballsy statement about, I can look at it, something from across the football field and tell you I can sell that, or right. I'll never sell that. I can sell this. Okay. I can't hear that because if I listen to Tom, I'll only make one kind of painting the rest of my life. Does that, does that happen? You get kind of in into the in your head and I don't like, like when he tells me what sells and what doesn't <laughs> sell. In fact, he can even tell you. I, I sometimes get upset when he sells my painting. Is that right? Yeah. Let's get back to the reason we're actually here today, is, yeah. is we need to find a couple of paintings for me to take away and promise not to try and sell. Okay. Okay? I saw <laughs> something over here I'd like to look okay. at. Okay, no problem. Okay. So I love red paintings, okay. and I don't think this is quite finished. Well, it's not quite done, but the, the approach is going to be, these parts that are whited out, there'll be also a red hue. Mm -hmm. I'm doing color on color, just like the blue. Now, if you put a little bit of red or something in that blue painting, yeah. would you put a little bit of blue in I, a red painting? I don't know. I might hit it with an, like, something. A it's green it's, it's complement. So, like, I'm trying to play complementary things, so I'm thinking green. So is this how you guys work together? Yes. A little bit collaboratively? You kind of... Oh, only on a bad day. That far. <laughs> he won't tell me 
you know, put a little green there and I can sell it. I wouldn't do something like that. But you know, it's fun to indulge him sometimes. And he also has the bigger plan because he knows what other artwork is going to go into the booth. So I will continue to work on this and put this on reserve so that we have something okay, nice. Okay, so we've got this picked out. We've got that one but on the floor picked out. what I wanted to show out. you, and if I can just she move She just this, ignored me on that. Something, well, I didn't, but I know, don't judge me on that. But I want to tell you that I have a wonderful stretcher maker and sometimes she makes these so beautiful I don't even know what to put on them. So it's the old Frank Stella thing like, yeah. what can look better than the blank canvas. Right. Can I show Tom something? If sure. you mind yeah, if I take absolutely. this over? Absolutely. Okay. So Julian, sometimes what I do in my process, in fact, not only sometimes, all the time, the reason why this studio is so crowded with works is because I like to work simultaneously on the floor and I mm -hmm. work in a very performative way where I traverse my paintings with this plank and I can also use it to sort of sit down and, and work on top of them. As a conservator, Anna, seeing you get on that plank just made my, my pulse skyrocket. I'll I mean, Look, Julia. Oh, I can't, I can't, I can't. Yeah. This gives me so much nerves. I like to to and fro them. I like to, to, to um, juxtapose them and move them around and start to see what kind of um, idea for that painting I can get from the periphery of whatever is else is going on. So when you work, do you have uh, ideas ahead of time or is it an organic process? Yeah, you kind of feel your way through it? Everything is generative in here. So okay. depending on where I'm working, what kind of space I have, these are little tiny oil paintings that are like palm size. And they're oh, sort of my, my doodles. Yeah. These are scaled proportionately exact, and then right. this scales, scales to my body space. Okay. Yeah. And so um, they're all specifically related to my frame. So it sounds like you've so. developed a framework, a rubric for creating artwork yeah. that seems to go hand in hand with the content. Like it's important not only the, the practice, right. the content, these things aren't separate, they need to be together. I presume you developed that over time. It didn't just come to you. Um, these are sort of symbolic. This is like a, a vocabulary, a visual vocabulary and vocabulary of color that I've worked with repeatedly for many, many years. So there's like this muscle memory so that's lexicon, involved. lexicon, right? Yeah. Exactly. And then um, there's a Robert Irwin quote, which I love, which is, if you do something, you must do it all the way through. So I just took that quite literally and started to be really all the way through to make sure there was like some through line, but that one work would work for me and generate another work and another work and another. So it's like an endless possibility. Okay. I see three more paintings I want. Okay, good. Well, point okay. them out. But okay. I, I want, I want. This one, yeah. this one, and that. You like those bleedy ones? I like these bleedy ones. Really? Yeah. And, I, well, and kind of, I, this one, I think I love that one too. It's different, but. Well, the problem I'm having with these is they I. They have a green edge. I put That's the a, green, no, it's tape. Oh, okay. Because I want to keep it clean. Oh, okay. That's for Julian. As an artist, do you think about that? Like materials and longevity of your work and, and how they're going to exist after you don't exist? Big, not as a rule. Question. Not as a rule, but I'm very well aware because I've had a great number of residencies and I've had like some really good materials and techniques classes when I was a student like I'm very aware of the chemistry in sure. fact I even pay attention to the different behaviors of the pigments chemistry yeah. so I know the sort of story and I'm pretty acclimated with all that stuff but when I don't have everything and I still want to work I still work you know yeah, what I mean if I, right. if I have to use OMS or if I have to use turpentine yeah. for example yeah. and I'm knowing I shouldn't I'm still gonna use it because right. that's all I have. I'm gonna still do it, and then that idea will still serve me for another work sure. that maybe be more conscientious about those things. Right, the art is paramount, and and that's the most important thing. Obviously, there are best practices and ideal practices, but at the end of the day, it's all about the art. Yeah, I think so. And also, I don't know if I need them to live 100 years after I'm 40 feet under. Ah, uh, you're they're killing. Gonna, they're gonna be. You're <laughs> like you're tearing the conservator in me apart. I mean, you know, between walking on top of them, uh, raw yeah, canvas, and who, you know, they don't need to live forever. Right. It's too much work. It's too much work. <laughs> Keeping them alive that long? Yeah, but... Um, it's another person's problem. Well, that's what Tom's for, too. That's what I'm for. Have I ever given you the lecture about signing, dating, and everything? Yes. Because as someone who has gotten a lot of cool old paintings from the flea market that are 100 years old, but you don't know who did it, I, I always say, sign them, date them title them, yeah. put, the titling. put where you live, well, you know, put what you had for breakfast because you're yeah. going to be gone someday yeah. and the painting is going to be, someone is going to have it and they want to know who made this thing. Okay, so I think I have a pretty good understanding. You start with those little oil sketches, they evolve into bigger pieces and then evolve into bigger pieces. Right. 
the ideas uh, kind of evolve, they generate themselves here, there's a dialogue, and then at some point you bring Tom in or Tom brings himself in to start <laughs> yeah. looking at what is going to leave the studio and become a gallery piece or go on to sale. And then the pieces kind of take a life of their own. And that's kind of the whole life cycle of a painting. I got it. All right. Sounds like a lot of work, but I think it makes a lot of sense. It has been a privilege to visit Anna's studio and talk with her about the art making process. The space is filled with vibrant energy and the intense and deliberate atmosphere is a testament to Anna's creative vision and her dedication to work. And in this space, in Anna's process, it's evident that these are the requirements to be a successful artist. Every brushstroke, every color choice, every mark on the canvas must be carefully considered and executed with precision and purpose. And while being in the studio has been enlightening, I still have one question that I wanted to ask. Is there anything that you wish you knew years ago when you were, when you were becoming who you are now that would have been great? Not to let the voices of doubt shut you down too much. It's a hard, hard thing to have the confidence to just simply believe in yourself. And then the importance of just developing a strong work ethic and discipline and always going for quality. Even when I'm asked to put work in auctions, I never put something that's like under my flat file. I, I see artists do that all the time. And then the third thing, be ready when the knock comes on the door again. <laughs> you know, if you only have three works that are really awesome, but there's not a whole lot going on, it's not such an impressive presentation, you know. When opportunity knocks, you've got to show up and, and be ready for it. Just to wrap up today's visit. Yeah. You're promising me yes. this painting, well, I'm the not red promising painting, that. you're promising me this painting, <laughs> the no. red painting, no. and maybe that one? I'll see what I finish that I, feel, that I feel great about, but I think it could be really exciting to put the red painting in that or the red painting in this. So yes, I'll, I'll figure this it out. This is how it always goes. I'll figure it out. Okay. Um, Just don't let any of your fan dealers <laughs> sweep in here. No, no, no. Okay. No, no.